Principles of Microeconomics, Chapter 4, Labor and Financial Markets, Professor Wagner. This is the outline for the chapter we're going to cover, and we're going to talk about labor markets, uh, domain and supply and financial markets, and the market system as an efficient mechanism for information. Demand and supply is not just about goods, but also labor markets. Nursing profession is a good example of this. This could also apply to analysis. So data, data scientist would be another profession. So human capital would be certainly a demand and supply situation. Uh, the labor market has uh, a, a law for supply and demand. And I think these things are fairly intuitive. Uh, the law of demand, they talk about the higher the salary, salary or wage uh, in the job market, there's a decrease in the quanti quantity of labor demanded by employers. So if the cost of people's time is expensive, they're going to be a lot more frugal about it, meaning the employer. Uh, lower the wage, you know, there will be an increase of uh, labor demanded simply because uh, businesses see this as an opportunity for expanding and growth. Uh, law of supply of labor markets, a higher price for labor, the higher quantity of labor supply. So, you know, if uh, it's beneficial for the worker to go to work because he's getting paid, uh, let's say, you know, well in comparison to maybe the past, uh, more people will be looking for work. If, you know, everybody's working for minimum wage and that's what's available, then certainly most people won't even bother getting out of bed. So the lower for price for labor and a lower quantity supplied, you know, is certainly an intuitive as well. And of course, there is an equilibrium point between the two, and that's where the law of supply and demand cross on a graph. This is the graph. And so you see several different points. And so this is the equilibrium of the both the demand and the supply line. Now, this curve here, the demand curve, is you know, kind of a, you know, really just connecting the dots type of thing, but it's got a general downward slope. If you did a linear regression, it would have a slope. Same with the supply line. So basically, you can go from here and say, as the, uh, as the below equilibrium salary, you know, takes place, there'll be excess demand or shortage and of you know of uh, workers at that particular point uh, up here where the higher salaries are higher there'll be an excess supply of labor well that stands the reason because everybody wants to go to work if you know the money's there once again just like uh, for goods you know uh, everything but price shifts uh, demand for goods and labor it's pretty much the same thing demand for output education and training technology number of companies government regs and price and availability of other inputs these are what we call endogenous or external factors and they would create the shift with respect to labor supply the number of workers available the required education and government policies these are the things that will shift the supply curve. Uh, points to, to consider. How will new technologies affect the wages of high skill and low skill workers? And use the four step process of analyzing how shifts in supply and demand affect the market. So we could discuss this briefly by saying, okay, new technologies will affect the wages of high skill workers and the, you know long as the uh, long as the new technologies and the skill of the workers are aligned meaning that there's some relevance or some uh, compatibility between the two and low skill workers well you know with automation you know taking place there'll be a lower there'll be a lower demand for the low skill workers and Frankly, you know, it's going to be minimum wage stuff. So anyways, just consider that. Technology and wages and applying demand and supply. And so graph A, it look, it, you have a shift 
of the demand curve going to the left. And so when technology can do the job previously done by these workers, that, you know, robots reduce the demand for physical labor. And at the same time, uh, the robots are reducing the low skilled labor, the quantity of high skilled labor, the demand for that is going up because you need people to fix and program the robots. Gloss returns probably for the test. You know what a salary and wage is. A minimum wage is also defined as a price floor, meaning that there's a you know, minimum amount people have to earn to go to work, legally speaking. And then a living wage is not the same as a minimum wage. For that matter, minimum wage is not a living wage. Unless you can uh, camp out in a tent or live under a bridge and still make it to work, that would not probably be a living wage for most people. Living wage would be enough money to cover all the essentials. So that's the difference. Well, this slide illustrates the example of a price floor, which is at $10. The equilibrium point here is the demand of 1,200 workers at $10. And then we want to take a look at imposing a wage floor at $12. What happens there? Well, the difference between this point and that point would be the excess supply or surplus of workers at that rate. And so 1,600 minus 700 of surplus would be 900 workers. The abandoned supply can also be applied to in the financial markets. Savings would be considered a financial capital. Borrowing would be demand for financial capital. And these are the definitions. Financial capital is basically economic resources measured in money. Interest rate is the price of money, basically. So it's the price of borrowing. And also, for the people who do in the lending, it's a rate of return on that investment. What an usury law is, is it imposes an upper limit on interest rates that lenders can charge. There's a lot of things uh, with respect to consumer protection and predatory lending, uh, which is something to consider. Uh, many credit cards, you know, just work right beneath the usury law. But, you know, when you think about it, 25% or 35% interest on a credit card, yeah, I wish I could invest a pool of my money in that and get that kind of rate of return. That's excellent. So, you know, that's what it is. It's, it could even be worse and has been in the past. That's why they have the consumer protection laws. And then this uh, is an illustration of demand and supply for borrowing money with credit cards. And so this is an explanation of the same. You have the equilibrium point. So 600 billion at the rate of 15% is considered the equilibrium point. And so as you move up or down or shifting the, you know, so if you say a 13%, there'll be a whole lot more people wanting to borrow, a whole lot more money that needs to go out at 13%. So there'll be a demand for this number here. If I can draw a straight line. So something above 600. And then, of course, something underneath 600, that would be the excess demand or shortage. So there would be a number. You know, you take this number, subtract that number, that would be considered a shortage. Same thing with supply. There'll be an excess supply at 20%, which is a fairly high rate. And so the difference between this point and this point will be the surplus. Now, this particular slide doesn't have a picture. So you may have to refer to the other one, the original uh, intersection of supply of S occurs at equal or U zero. So there could be a price ceiling set at interest rate RFC below the equilibrium rate. So the interest rate cannot adjust upward to the equilibrium. So that would create excess demand and shortage. Uh, there is a term called intertemporal decision making. And this is what, whether a consumer decides to consume goods now in the future. Um, a good example, and, I'll, and you should think of some others, is let's talk about oil. Oil is considered essential to the, you know, the infrastructure of the United States. 
And so when to consume goods, we have what we call a national oil reserve, or we have you know just barrels upon barrels, millions, billions of barrels stockpiled for our use at the point that everybody else decides to freeze the market. So for some period of time, we'll still have oil, irrespective of whether the Middle East or other producers of oil, you know, continue to sell oil or not. And so we have to decide whether we go ahead and use our own resources or just simply uh, go ahead and buy theirs. So today, when we're talking about a $25 barrel of oil, well, this is really, really cheap. So in a sense, yeah, we should buy up all we can at that price and stockpile it. Now, that might impact uh, our drillers, so there is a balancing question in play. So I just wanted to kind of give you an example of a dynamic. This, uh, the effect of growing U.S. debt. So basically, it's talking to the demand for financial capital from and the supply of capital in the U.S. financial markets by the foreign sector before the increase of uncertainty regarding U.S. public debt. So the equilibrium point is our starting point once again. So we have a certain quantity demanded at a certain rate of return. When the enthusiasm of foreign investors for investing their money in the U.S. economy diminishes, the supply of financial capital shifts to the left. So this is where we began, and the supply curve shifts from S0 to S1. In the new point of equilibrium, there's less money being demanded because the rate of return, or the rate of return is higher. Demand and supply models, to speak about efficiency of information, the horizontal axis shows different measures of quantity. And so these are the three items in particular. So it could be a good or service, labor, or financial capital. And the vertical axis is showing the price of a good or service or a wage or a rate of return in the financial market. Price controls uh, impact uh, the equilibrium of prices and quantities, and the changes in supply demand essentially uh, reveal themselves through the producer and consumer behavior. And price, price controls may deprive everybody in the economy of this critical information. So you won't really know what the true demand and true uh, supply is because things, you know, there are controls put in place that inhibit, you know, the, you know, the true demand and the true supply uh, created. Without this information, buyers and sellers really just don't know how to react to changes throughout the economy. This is a generic demand and supply curve. And so you have some Q, a quantity, and these are the things we just spoke about earlier. And then at some price, here's your equilibrium where the two lines cross. And these are the two uh, pricing type of items that we spoke about earlier. Uh, an example, we can speak to the demand for nurses as boomers get older. And so the quantity of nurses in this case to demand as boomers get older, because old, you know, older you know, portions of our demographic require more medical care, that would create an upward demand for nursing. So at D0, it would shift to D1. And so the equilibrium point where you could uh, get nurses at about $65,000, there was a certain quantity, but we need more nurses. And so to find those nurses, we have to pay some, some uh, salary that's higher than the 65,000 in order to find our new equilibrium point here. This is an example of uh, decreasing supply of nurses between 2014 and 2024 or what they think. And so let's suppose as demand for nurses increases, supply shrinks due to increasing number of nurses entering retirement and increases of tuition and nursing degrees. Uh, that's certainly a factor that's uh, in play today. This causes a leftward shift of the supply 
And so you, that means the salaries will go up for nurses entering the field. We don't know if the number of nurses will increase or decrease, but we know that the salaries are going to go up. 